Hi, I'm Jack Abraham. I'm the founder and managing partner of Atomic. We start companies and invest in them. And I am panicked about inflation. Howard, what's up, buddy? Everything. I-, I can hear my hair growing. That's how quiet it is in this room. I know. And I think it is. It might be good for you, I but it's really nervy for me to hear your hair growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. This room should be sponsored by Manscaped because I can hear my <laughs> hair growing. It really uh, should. Let's call Paul. <laughs> right now, and it's creeping me out because I know my hair is growing everywhere but on my head, and it just it's loud in my own. This is what it's like being me. It's very loud inside my head, even when you've quieted the room. Speaking of hair, and I only say this because any guest would have more hair than me, I'm excited about our guest. He's a young man. He's been doing startups since he was four or five, um, <laughs> ran away from home, loved the internet. He's now like 14. I don't even know if he's old enough legally to be on this show and talk about the stuff that he's going to talk about. I think he's 14 or 15, but he is uh, he's actually in his mid-30s, but doing internet startups. Um the first time I heard his name was uh, we were back by True Ventures and he had started a company called Milo, which ended up getting acquired quickly by eBay for somewhere between 80 and $90 million in his early 20s. And I just found out in talking to him that he's good friends from Wharton with Zach Weinberg, who's been on our show. You remember Zach? I do. Yeah. From uh, Invite Media and Flatiron Health and Nat Turner, who won't come on the show, who's, who's really funny guy, but just hates doing that stuff. But Zach who's a little bit grumpy, loves doing the show. <laughs> so so Jack is like good friends with these guys, and they all were in the same class. It's like murderer's row of of founders. Because, uh, you know, when I went, when when you and I were at MBA at, at ASU, Canute, yeah. drinking and doing sun and testing a out vague SPF memory of that. formulas yeah. as our MBA program, and icy drinks. Ooh. Uh, yeah. When we were doing that, and at, back then when we were doing MBA, Every, if you went to Warren, you were just going into banking. Now I think everybody wants to be startups. So they were at the early cusp of Wharton, probably crossover into not just banking and finance. So this is this murderous row of founders. Uh, I have so many things to talk about because he continues to start companies. He has a company called Atomic, which is kind of like a studio, a modern studio. And I've had no success in this model. So we're going to talk about studios, liquidity, uh, Miami. Uh, San Francisco, um, what Atomic's doing around company creation and investing, uh, so much that I want to talk about. We'll probably maybe have to have a couple. But most importantly, he's interesting because he was in San Francisco, moved to Miami. He's young. He's taking risk. Uh, he's living on the edge of entrepreneurial vision and technology and finance. And so, great. Let's have uh, Jack Abraham. We got him on. Jack. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I gave people a little background. And so I want to start with today. It's 2022. Mm -hmm. You're living in in Miami. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that move. Because, you know, it was kind of funny. It was, was, um, you know, I've talked about it on this podcast. I'm from Toronto and Toronto people, Jewish people went to Florida. I went to Arizona. No need to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. But last year I mixed all the 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 joking and the seriousness of we're moving to Miami, you were one of the first to go. Mm-hmm. And so what was it? What were the turning points for you leaving San Francisco for Miami? Yeah, so, so there were a number of things. You know, it, it was a funny and interesting story. I, I originally came to Miami during the pandemic. It was June of 2020. I was supposed to only come for a seven-day trip with some friends from New York. And unfortunately, three to four days into the trip, I ended up getting covid Thankfully for me, it, it wasn't that bad, you know, but my, my friends, it turned out, had actually taken antibody tests. It turns out they had had COVID too. They were willing to stay with me. I obviously couldn't fly back to San Francisco, so the return was canceled. And as a result, I was kind of forced actually to stay in Miami for an extra month. My friends and I started renting different Airbnbs in different parts of the city, 
you know, places where people really live, less less the south beaches of the world and places where people come and tourists are. And through that process, I just really fell in love with the city and the potential of the city. I think Miami is very, very interesting. It's it's kind of got the best elements of New York and LA in yeah. one city. It's got the the energy of New York. You've got amazing food options. You've got a lot of diversity of industries, diversity of people. You can go into places like Brickell. You feel like you're in Manhattan. And then LA, and then it's got you know the water, the beaches, the weather, style, fashion, culture. Um, but you know, notably, it's a, it's a much denser place. It's not as kind of spread out with all of the traffic that that you'd find in a place like LA. And and I think the thing that always made the Bay Area so special was the people. And you know, I've actually been really blown away with the people. Not only that were here before I came, but of course, there's been this compounding effect of just incredible people coming to Miami. And you know, it, it feels like what what Tel Aviv is to Israel, which is this mm-hmm. you know incredible tech finance metropolis of, of Israel. It feels like that's kind of what Miami is coming to the United States. And I'm I'm extremely bullish on the city, and you know, just fell in love with it so much. I looked at 25 houses, found one that I fell in love with, bought it in August of 2020, and basically never looked back. I actually didn't even um, go back to San Francisco originally to get my stuff. I, I loved it so much, and uh, I've been here ever since. And we appreciate there is going to be a podcast studio there for us, uh, Panic East. Yeah. Um, do you have a basement? We're worried about flooding, Canoe and I. We'd like to be up high. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so yeah. you were 24. I'm going to jump over because I'm excited because, you know, we don't know each other, so, but I'm excited to talk to you and we know each other's backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I was introduced by one of your partners, Chester, who's mm-hmm. great. He was San Diego boy up in San Francisco, and he, too, got the bug and moved with his wife and family to Miami. Mm-hmm. I totally get it. I'm 56, couldn't move, mm-hmm. but, man. Love Wynwood, love the food, love South Beach. I could totally do four or five months a year there. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's now jumped. I've got Phoenix, San Diego, Tuscany, Florence, New York, and then Miami's quickly jumped. In. It wasn't even on my map. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even in my top 100, and now it's in my top five, can't wait to go back type cities. So, yeah. It's impossible that it's not a thing. Yeah. What do you worry about for Miami? Because it is kind of crowded and trafficy. And so, what what are the things that you worry about as having just moved there? You've set up a great operation in Wynwood or, or whatever area that's called. I think it's Wynwood that I've been to the offices. Is there anything that you worry about? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I I think that it's a new ecosystem that that's clearly been booming and. I did help seed it. I was here, at least from the West Coast. I think I was the earliest one here from this wave. I was catching up with people on Zooms, telling them the, you know, at at first when I told them I moved to Miami, they they looked at me like I had three heads. It's like, why are you, (laughs) what are you doing? Jack, we know you're serious. We know you're doing all this work. Why are you in Miami? You're obviously not there to party. Tell us more about it. So, you know, I told them about it. And, you know, more than half of them ended up moving here. So major people that ran, you know, major firms, um, you know, people from Founders Fund and Kraft and helped with, you know, Thrive and Andreessen and a bunch of other big firms, but also a bunch of founders kind of get them over here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this this place has spread like a virus where those people then bring other people. And, you know, I've directly probably brought dozens of people here, but then they bring more people and more people and it just stacks and stacks. And it's kind of like as we think about products in the technology industry, Miami is just an extraordinarily sticky product where people come and as long as they're willing to come and give it a shot and they experience it, the conversion rate is extraordinarily high. So as long as that conversion rate stays very high and people keep coming, Miami is going to do extraordinarily well. And I've continued to see that, you know, happening over time. I think of course, what always happens is when these, these places boom, you have to worry about the real estate and you yeah. have to worry about real estate prices, real estate prices and going up. Uh, you have to worry about schools. There are some really good school options in Miami, but they're growing. Thankfully, yeah. they're growing with the demand. But, um, you know, rents are up 50 percent year over year. Home prices are up. Banana. You know, I think it's yeah. probably the, the fastest growing in in the country. The one thing that gives me hope is, is you look around the city 
and there's cranes everywhere. So unlike, you know, San Francisco, where I came from, where they basically didn't Good allow point. any new buildings to exist, you couldn't build high, um, you know, here they're very permissive on building. There's something like 23 or 24 skyscrapers going up in the next couple of years. And unlike Manhattan or, you know, San Francisco, which are landlocked, San Francisco in a peninsula shape, island in, uh, you know, Manhattan in being an island, you can actually just continue building west in Miami. Um, there's a ton of land. So I'm actually very optimistic that as long as the city allows people to keep building, that it's going to do extraordinarily well and the real estate price will be kept in check. But in the short term, it's just been such a massive influx that, you know, there have been these increases and 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 that can end up spilling into other things. So I think I think that that's a consideration, um, you know, that people are thinking through. Yeah, well, kudos to you because Chester showed me the operation and I was blown away because I think you picked a perfect location. When would the guy who bought that real estate, it's a genius, obviously, it took forever, but and it's still early days of that area. Yeah. But, you know, walking through the operation, seeing, like you've built a place where if I, like if I come to Phoenix, and I shame on me, but we're finally building out an office and some kind of presence here, because Phoenix has not had a good conversion rate for a long time. It didn't recover until very recently from the real estate crash. Miami just has crashes all the time from whatever, because it's, it's got this influence of all over the world, whereas Arizona was just like one trick. Yeah. It was, you come here, you speculate, you buy six homes, you hand them off to your dog, they buy six homes. And then that ended. And now we have this new boom, which is quietly because of, you know, it's not 0% tax, but close enough with the with the recent pushbacks of four, four-ish percent. We've got health care. Um, obviously, we have uh, tourism. We have this incredible weather. We have an incredible airport. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have incredible schools. But we haven't had that. It's a pretty spread out kind of like L.A. thing, much Mm -hmm. like, I guess, Florida. And so we've never had that epicenter where at least what you guys did with Atomic, what I noticed when I came to the office, there's like a hub now. There's like a center. If I were to come as a a founder or as a as someone who wants to work at a startup or in the VC, like Atomic's like that whole area is like you can get centered and know where you stand in the ecosystem for as spread out as Miami. So so kudos. How did you decide to just do that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it was funny. It was in the very early days of Miami. Um, Keith Boys and I were having dinner with the mayor of Miami and we were sort of deciding there was a little bit of a debate, you know, what what's the best place to to put startup companies? There's a lot of different places you could go. Um, Brickle is really interesting. Coconut Grove is really interesting. There's some arguments for Miami Beach or South Beach. And, you know, I pretty strongly advocated for for Wynwood. There were already some startups there. And, you know, it's a very fast changing part of the city. It kind of felt like how Soma maybe felt um, in San Francisco in 2010. A lot of open space, very creative space, lots of coffee shops, new restaurants opening. Um, also very artsy, like really cool art scene going on there. And, you know, clearly a lot more space to build and and build up. So. We, we thought that that would just be a great place to be. And as a result, um, somewhat coordinated, we put Founders Fund and Atomic in the same building. We put, we, we got a few floors of the building. Founders Fund got one. Ramp is in there. I think we have Live Nation. And then there's a bunch of venture capitalists that are all getting space in this building. And, you know, it's kind of really in the epicenter on the block are some of our favorite yep. restaurants in the city, favorite lunch spots, coffee shops. And, um, you know, across the street, there are two mega new buildings going up. So the the place is just being built very, very, very quickly. And, you know, smart people have seen that, like actually David Sachs, who, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure he would tell you I'm the first person he learned about Miami from. And he ended up buying a house here partially because of me, ended up liking it so much he bought our building. So he's our new landlord. Oh, wow. The junior Trump growing <laughs> awesome. there, but he is funny. I like I had him on the pod. He's, he's just so funny. Yes. Yeah. So that's cool. I mean, listen, the guy is so smart. You guys, like, I don't know anything about anything, but I know when I'm at, I can't build anything, but I know when I'm standing in it that it's cool. So congrats on that for what that's worth. Thank you. Uh, in Phoenix, we're starting to finally think about it. And, I, you know, for years, I just, Phoenix was so spread out. Knut and I went to Tempe ASU, 
and I moved to Coronado, which when I, I was young enough to have the urge, when I landed on Coronado, I'm like, wait a minute. This should be a home for like every startup that wants to get away from San Francisco. Yep. I never could figure out San Diego. There's just too much good, well, taxes, but San Diego is such a great city, but like there's too many choices to chill and not work. And I think that's the biggest issue with, you know, you got the West Coast vibe, plus such great weather and so many outdoor activities. like, you can't get people to focus. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so San Diego's not the place. Whereas I come to Phoenix, mm -hmm. and now there's startups here. You got ASU. And I've always thought, like, where's the place? And I think Scottsdale is the place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we finally took a spot here. And, and we'll slowly, I wish I was 20 years younger, but we'll slowly start thinking about making it a hub. Because mm -hmm. I think Scottsdale, with our airport and with, you know, access to Utah and even Mexico and L.A. and San Francisco and direct flights to Miami and New York. I think Phoenix could be a top five kind of startup hub. But uh, yeah. are you done with San Francisco? Like there's no home, no nothing, no base? Yeah, I, I have no ties to San Francisco or the state of California for that matter. I, I went back two times because I had to. One was for a wedding and then one was um, to speak at a conference. Um, and it was just so strange going back. It's just such a strange feeling going back. It's really a, a place that's transformed. It's very sad um, because it really was, uh, you know, at least speaking for San Francisco, such an incredible city with such remarkable opportunity in front of it. And it is so dramatically different now, unfortunately. Um, and I just don't know anyone there. Any like when I go when I go to San Francisco, I don't even know who to ping anymore because, you know, almost everyone I know has left at this point. Particularly anyone under the age of thirty five has left. There's some people that maybe live in Atherton or yeah, you know, outside of the airport, city, even yeah, kind of down yeah. by Menlo Park. That that's a whole different situation and scene and they haven't experienced what's been going on in, in the city of San Francisco. But San Francisco has definitely transformed. It's not that it's going to, you know, go to zero or anything. But if you just look at the statistics of net outflows, you know, where jobs are going and decreasing and company migration and, and everything, the city is materially struggling. And, um, you know, I certainly hope that there will be things that will bring it back, but um, I, it feels like there's going to need to be a lot of work that's going to need to be done. Yeah, a lot of work and then there. time. Because I was just there, and I like it better now than I did four years ago as a visitor, I mean, meaning I love walking the streets when they're empty and no tech bros and no tech people, and it's a pretty city on a nice day. But I was like in San Fran and no one pinged me. I was like, I'm here, and I couldn't uh -huh. even set up one meeting. Not to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and when I used to land, it would right. just be lit up. Totally different. And I'd ask people to come meet me, which is, you know, the way I liked San Francisco, mm -hmm. to be honest, because I never had bought into the, to the whole thing there. I think the weather has to be better. Like, sorry. Like, I think. Yeah. And so Miami is, is definitely going to win. People, people after COVID are going to want the good weather. All right. So now let's go back to Milo, because this goes to like your huge vision around liquidity and big problems. Let's talk about the first company. You were very mm -hmm. young. How, like, talk quickly about Milo, what mm -hmm. it was trying to do and the evolution, because it led to Postmates and all this liquidity and delivery and food. So what was the original vision? Yeah. So the original thesis and vision is that just commerce was being transformed in the US, where people were turning to the internet. Obviously, the internet has such a wealth of information on products, ratings, reviews, you can see different pricing on products. And at the time, there was this phenomenon, research online, buy offline, where mm -hmm. people would do their research online, but they'd buy offline. The problem is nobody could figure out what was available in a store. You'd have to literally call the store, be put on hold. Someone would go in the stock room, rummage around, figure out you know, what a store would have. And we thought, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So we built a search engine kind of like how Kayak searches flight inventory systems to tell you in real time, here's the flight availability, here's the pricing across all of these airlines for something that you want. We would do that for, for products in stores. So we'd search inventory systems. We'd say, here's what's in stock. Here's what's out of stock. Here are all the options of what's available. Here's the pricing, the ratings, the reviews 
across, you know, at, at one point, I believe we had more than half of the top 100 retailers in the United States on the platform, over 100,000 stores. And, you know, we basically made them searchable at your fingertips from the internet. And the original model was, you know, people could do buy online, pick up in store, which they did. And we quickly thought, you know, a, a huge driver for this behavior, by the way, was instant gratification. You know, people didn't want to wait for shipping. They, they wanted to go and, and see the product. They wanted to get it instantly. So we quickly started thinking, well, what if you could bring the, these products to people's homes and create a delivery network that would do that? You could deliver potentially products in an hour, whereas Amazon could take you know a lot longer. That would be potentially very interesting for people. And that's that's what started getting me um, thinking along the delivery lines. And um, you know, before we could really work on that problem, we were acquired by eBay. I was I was 24 years old at the time. You know, it was a great outcome. We hadn't raised a lot of capital, as you mentioned. True was kind of the. Sorry, the main right. had you only done a seed? It was kind of like a seed A, yeah. So it was. We were a very capital efficient company. We had a ton of great angels in our company. We had, you know, Keith, who was on my board, Kevin Hartz. We had Chris wow. Dixon, Ron Conway. You know, kind of a who's who at that point. And it was a great experience. Um, and then, you know, I was put in charge of the local division post acquisition of eBay. Um, you know, but but was obsessed with this. You know how. How can you give people this instant gratification experience without them necessarily having to go to the store and get it in the car, which started getting me thinking down the lines of, of delivery and led to some of the insights that, you know, led to the creation of the idea for Postmates, which I shared and, you know, was actively involved in. Yeah. So let's talk about it because Milo was bought before the iPhone. Milo was bought after the iPhone. It was kind of started right around when the iPhone was taking off and apps were starting to take off. So, you know, we had a huge amount of web traffic and we had created a mobile app that was working. Um, we had a huge amount of organic traffic, um, which was great, but we also syndicated our data across the internet. We were powering shopping on the other search engines. So, you know, Yahoo's search engines for shopping, you know, Microsoft, CNET, Consumer Reports, so all sorts of places across the internet. We had tens of millions of unique monthly shoppers that we reached. I think at, at the height, it was probably above 50 million a month in addition to um, our app and our website. Um, so, yeah, we had pretty tremendous reach by the so, time we were Yeah, and Chris Dixon had sold his company to eBay. So, so t- let's just walk through for the my nieces and nephews who listen, and they're all this that age, 24-ish. So, mm-hmm. so walk us through the choice at the time, because you had capital, you could keep going, or did they just mm-hmm. know, did, was the price just the right price that just made it too tempting for you, or were you nervous? Like, what, what do you remember what it felt like and what the decision was to go it alone or to take the deal? Yeah, part of it for me at that point in my life was I, I was very young. I did love this idea. I loved what I was working on, but... I wanted to be an entrepreneur for the rest of my life. And actually my dream was to build Atomic, which we'll talk mm-hmm. about, which you know is essentially a company that builds companies. I had had that idea for a really long time. And because we hadn't raised a lot of capital, it basically would give me the resources to do that or anything I'd want to do for the rest of my life. And um, you know, it seemed like the prudent thing to do, I would say, given that at that time, I was going to be given a really big role. Um, I had had some friends, Nat and Zach. We actually had done a 5% for 5% stock swap between our companies. Their company sold for yeah. around the same price at the same time to Google, which was a, also a funny story. And I just, you know, it was kind of for me an enabler of freedom for the rest of my life to, you know, pursue my lifelong dream of starting tons of companies and, you know, being ultra productive and and investing and um, all sorts of other things that I, I ultimately wanted to do that were kind of the long term thing that that I was interested in. Um, and, you know, I, I could have continued to go at it alone. And if, if we had, I, I had the ideas for Instacart in there and DoorDash and things we were working on. And we might have ended up going down those directions. Who knows? I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't regret it because I, I love what I'm doing now. And, and that's kind of what I what I had dreamed of doing. So you're 24. Who called you first, Morgan or Goldman Sachs? <laughs> uh, and did you take their call? Well, yeah, I, I guess another part of the motivating factor that we, we ended up, because we were syndicating our data across uh-huh. the internet, 
we had a lot of potential acquirers mm -hmm. that were interested in buying our company. So we had a lot of people that were coming to us saying, man, you guys have done this, this is a really hard problem. You know, we're, we either want to, we, we want this, like we want, we're gonna build it, we're gonna buy you guys. One of those companies was Google. Google, by the way, is very difficult to deal with if you're an entrepreneur. They basically said, you know, look, we, you sell us for to us for this price or we're gonna build this thing. Right. I didn't like that. I told them no, and they didn't like that. So we ended up competing head to head with Google. You know, they ended up making other passes at us. And at some point I just, I just didn't like them to be honest. So I, I flagged it to eBay because I felt like they were a better partner. They made us an offer that I felt like was fair and that we couldn't refuse. I never went back and told Google they missed out on the deal and they were really upset about it. And I thought they deserved it um, because I, you know, how they treat entrepreneurs isn't great always in the context of acquisitions. They, they did things like, you know, they tried to buy our company and then we said no. And then afterwards they had our search traffic plummet That's by evil. like 80% overnight, for example. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty That's bad. That's interesting. Um, well, so, what's interesting is how they've struggled since. So, so jokes on them. No. So the interesting thing there is you had 5% of, of, of Nat and Zach's company and they'd sold before you to Google. Yeah. They had sold before me about six months before. Me I wonder Google. if Google treated uh, them the same way well, That's for another podcast, but for young people, that's really an interesting point. All these decisions that you had to make, obviously the key point is you were in a position of strength, even though Google was breathing down your neck and threatening. You were in a position of strength because you had, you knew what you were doing, you had product market fit, and obviously you knew you were onto something. But I'm, I mean, it's interesting because maybe as a 40 year old, you wouldn't have sold. Yeah. So a lot of it had to do that you were 24 and you knew that you were going to start more companies. A lot of it had to do with that. It, it is a little scary thinking about competing with Google. I know yeah. that motivated Nat and Zach as well to sell. Yeah. Now the business they sold to Google is a huge part of Google. They treated that acquisition very differently. They, It's another conversation maybe yeah. to have with them. I, I, I don't want to spill it. No, 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 no. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, they're, uh, they have a strategy that's worked well for them. So, so now you're at eBay two years and you're built, you're, you're learning a lot. You, they give you a lot of, um, resources and leeway to go the pizza thing where you're, you can build small teams and small products. So, mm -hmm. so tell me how post the founders come to you at Postmates, which is again, solving a liquidity problem. And mm -hmm. you just, even though it was kind of conflicted, you got approval to invest. So just walk me quickly before we get to Atomic. The, the Postmates story is fascinating because it just shows that you've just continued with this scratch or this itch and this domain experience down this path. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I had been thinking a lot about how do you do this kind of last mile delivery? How do you mm -hmm. let people get things instantly? How do you give them instant gratification in cities of anything they might want from a city? And, you know, at Milo, we were focused on products. So I was thinking about products, but the lesson of, you know, building anything in local or local marketplaces is you want to focus on the most frequent use cases to build up liquidity if you can, and then you can get the less frequent use cases. So the use case of getting food versus getting products was much more frequent. You know, people need to eat a lot more often. They need to meet, eat multiple times a day. So I had been thinking a lot about, you know, could it be possible to build something very disruptive and interesting in the food category that could build the liquidity for a delivery, um, you know, sort of fleet? And the specific idea that I had, and one of the things that I had learned from my, my time being an entrepreneur in commerce and also at eBay is what tends to win is the maximization of selection and price in marketplaces. So Amazon wins because you can find nearly everything there and you can find great prices eBay, that's been an edge for a long time. Walmart, that's been a big edge. And, you know, Seamless and Grubhub, who were the leaders at the time, the right. problem with those businesses was you, they'd call on these restaurants and the only restaurants you could order from were ones that made it through their sales process. So some salesperson would call the restaurant, they'd give them their menu, it'd get uploaded. So by definition, the selection was only restaurants that, you know, kind of were willing to work with those companies. And I thought, Hmm, okay, here's an interesting idea. You know, what if you flip this on its head? And what if instead you got all of the menus of every restaurant in a city, you scrape them or, you know, you had 
people, you know, from Mechanical Turk, pulled them down, put them in a database, and then you made an app where people could add anything to their cart. You called in the order through a call center. You don't need to have a fax setup relationship or an iPad with them. You place the order, and then you have a delivery fleet that can go and pick up the order. And at the time, there was an enabling technology I had just learned about because eBay and PayPal were the same company, which was you could dynamically load funds onto a debit card of someone mm -hmm. in an instant and then pull it off in an instant. And you know the problem is if you had a, a huge fleet of delivery people with credit cards running around and buying things at terminals of restaurants, all you would need would be one delivery person to go to Best Buy, buy the big TV, and you know that fraud would basically make the economics of the business not work and the whole business would fail. But with this dynamic debit card loading program, if it was a $70 order, you could just load $70 onto the card right when the GPS said they were at the restaurant. It would clear the transaction and it prevented the ability for the delivery people to do fraud. So these oh. were kind of the building blocks of, you know, you can get every, every place you could order from a city online without their permission. You could order from them without their permission and you could pay using this new di dynamic debit card technology. Um, and at the time, you know, I've been thinking about doing this potentially. Javed Kareem, the co-founder of YouTube, who was an investor in Milo, had introduced me to the founders of Postmates. They had kind of come over and talked to me about what they were working on. And they were working on something very, very different. They were working on a uh, B2B delivery company that would basically deliver furniture or like heavy goods from businesses to people's homes. So uh -huh. very different business model. Again, sales model like Seamless and Grubhub, you sell the uh, furniture place, hey, people don't like to bring their furniture home, we'll do the last mile delivery for you. And, you know, then that place has to convert the customer and, you know, send them to post. Yeah, and it was like a pick, safe pick and do the extension of what existed. Exactly. A safe extension of what existed. And I met up with them a couple of times. I love meeting with and mentoring entrepreneurs. And at some point I ran through the math with them and, and I was like, guys, I'm so sorry. This just isn't going to work from a math perspective. The The sales costs of getting these furniture places is too expensive. The number of people that are going to come and place these orders and the profit you're going to make on them, it's just not going to work. It's not going to scale, you know, but I, I kept meeting up with them and I just kept thinking, should I give them this idea? Should I not give them this idea? At the time, I'd actually tried to convince eBay to do this. They didn't want to do it. I tried to convince eBay to do Instacart too. They didn't want to do that. Um, and I had a, a three-year or four-year maybe even non-compete after the acquisition of eBay um, where I couldn't do anything in this space and I wanted this product to exist. So I sat the founders down. I basically told them, you know, look, here's my observations on what you're doing today but here's how you can conquer this problem. And if you wanted to build last mile delivery at scale, here's how you would do it. And basically their jaws dropped there. You could hear a pin drop in the room. Their entire team was in the room. Their entire team heard it. There was like 20 seconds of silence. And then like after that, they just started building it and they stayed up for three days and they built the thing. And I was the first user as the VIP and it worked and it caught fire like wildfire in the right days. away. Um, Pretty soon thereafter, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. such a compelling value prop. You know, yeah. all these places you couldn't order from, all of a sudden you could instantly. And, you know, that really kicked off this whole modern food delivery thing. It, it was um, two years before DoorDash and then, you know, many years before Uber Eats. And, you know, I think I think it was a, a DoorDash size opportunity that, you know, the it, it was possible for for it to become that. You know, there are a number of reasons why I think it didn't. I'm also friends with Tony Shu and I have tremendous respect for him and think is he, he did DoorDash? a fantastic job. He, yeah, he's the CEO of DoorDash. I've heard he nothing is. but he's great a... things about it. I've been watching the stock here, just hearing nothing but great things. He's a fantastic human being and has just built such an amazing team underneath him. So $33 billion. So, yeah. so you ended up selling to Uber for a couple billion, four billion? Well, I don't know what the number was. I think it was a little more than a couple of billion at a time when Uber's stock was depressed. So it ended up being worth more. Um, it wasn't my decision or anything. Right. You know, I didn't found this company. I ended up giving the idea and being an early angel and investing a bunch more along the way and, you know, being active with the founders. But 
I wasn't an operator at all. No, no, no. But I mean, this goes down to like what I do around finance. Right. I can't do everything, right. but you just want to be around all these people. It's kind of like what happened in comedy with Gary Shandling and, and you know, I, I, it's like investing is like this too. You can't be, you need people. So yeah. uh, God bless you for sharing that with them. And they ran with it. And are they yeah. still at Uber or are they off doing their next thing? They're off doing their next thing. Yeah, pretty shortly thereafter, there were some debates within Uber around, you know, obviously I think they want to maximize their market share relative to DoorDash. It's a massive portion of their business at this point, food delivery. And it, uh -huh. it's, you know, been the fastest growing, particularly through the pandemic as ride sharing has gone down. So it was strategic to them from that perspective. Um, and there was just a debate of, does it stay separate? Does it get integrated into Uber Eats? Do the customer bases get integrated? And, you know, through some of those strategic discussions, which I probably can't share too much yeah. on, basically it aired a little bit more toward Uber. So the, the founders are now doing other things, yeah. I believe. Well, and they're not hurting. So it's a win-win. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a world where everything gets integrated and aggregated and disaggregated again. So that's the way it works. And, it, and DoorDash, from what I've heard, has just done a miraculous job. So it would have mm -hmm. been, you know, an epic war. Yeah. But wow, what a prize. DoorDash was like at seventy billion not too many months ago, so it's like yep. still a thirty-three billion dollar market cap. Fascinating. So now you you start Atomic. Mm -hmm. So let's just and we'll end with this, but I want to give you some time here and we'll have you back to talk about Atomic because this is this is fascinating to me. I'm fascinated by studio model. I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm by uh, the complexities of doing multiple things at once as a non-operator myself mm -hmm. um, or someone who struggles or didn't get the mentorship or just doesn't care about operating but can appreciate it. So you do Atomic. I would have recommend if you and I had known each other, I said, don't do it. Don't structure it this way. Just do a two and 20 or two and a half and 20. Mm -hmm. You'll be happier. Mm -hmm. um, so what were the decisions between doing a two and 20 versus atomic and and atomic to me is like all about company creation again it goes to liquidity is the art versus science of starting companies so what are all these factors that make you say i'm going to put a stake in the ground i'm going to do studio i'm going to do it what were the tweaks that make you think this was the way yeah good question so after i'd sold milo to ebay i I had this great opportunity. I'm a, I'm a big believer in not wasting time. And obviously, um, Knut and I are obviously big believers in not doing much compared. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so I wanted to make sure to learn something from that experience. And I studied how big companies had really innovated. And I, I think Amazon is this just incredible company in terms of their hit rate, ability to innovate, enter into new spaces. And Jeff Bezos has all these incredible um, you know, principles around innovation, one of which I was fascinated with, which, which is this principle around two pizza teams, which is, you know, even at Amazon, if it's a huge idea, it could be AWS, it could be Amazon fulfillment, it could be, you know, something really, really big. The initial team that builds it can't be bigger than that with which could be fed by two pizzas. Hmm. So think of a, you know, handpicked team by Jeff or one of his lieutenants, three, three to eight person team, kind of quarantined off from the mothership, they get to go work on finding product market fit. And only once it's working, then they put the, the big organization on it and put the resources in it and the capital and you know scale up the teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And I thought I might try my hand at that at eBay. I built about six of these different teams under me, building different products for the company. A bunch of what we built hit. It was driving, you know, lots of conversations in the company, press cycles, the stock price in major ways. Very exciting time to be there. The biggest thing I built, 130 million monthly active users ended up using. So that was kind of a big deal. And I just found out, you know, I really like this parallelization of product development and working across teams. And at the same time, I'd had a commute from San Francisco to San Jose. I had a lot of time in the car. I was constantly thinking about what am I going to do after eBay? What's going to be my next thing? And I got in the habit of writing down these ideas for what my next company could be. By the time I was ready to leave, I had 250 potential ideas for my next company written down in a Nevernote file. And I kind of put two and two together, which was to say, if I can successfully put together these two pizza teams for eBay, where nobody gets any upside, if any of this stuff works, and you know you can't use open source and it's a 50 million line code base and there's politics and bureaucracy at the company you have to fight through to get things done 
from first principles, it just seems like it should be a lot easier to do that with startups. You can pick anyone in the world to work with. Everyone can get a lot of upside. You can work on any problem in the world. You can use open source, et cetera. It's like completely unconstrained by contrast. So, you know, with that as kind of the first principles thinking, I started Atomic in 2012 with my own capital around this idea of how do we take these 250 ideas and find the top 10? What's the process to do that? There must be some way to get smart on ideas and spaces with a limited amount of capital and just find the best ones and then just focus on building the very best ones and investing to start the company and then continue investing to scale it as it goes. Um, and I think there were a few things that we did that were kind of very different from other people who tried this, this model. One was we scaled it very slowly, and I think that was a good decision. So the first year, we only did one company. Our second year, we did two. The third year, we did three. Fourth year, we did four. Then we did five. More recently, we've scaled it up. We now have a team of 55 people that are company builders. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, we did six. Two years ago, we did nine. Last year, we did 14. Wow. But that's over a decade, right, of scaling the infrastructure required and the team required to be able to do a lot of companies at once because we're just huge believers in quality over quantity. And there's this sort of marshmallow test you have to pass with this model of if you have 250 ideas and you know now it's up above 650 ideas and you have capital and the ability to try them all, the ever-present temptation is to try them all. And it's literally the worst possible thing you could do because you end up spreading yourself way too thin. There's way too much going on. You don't have the infrastructure set up. You don't have the team. You can't put yourself behind anything enough. And you end up with a lot of half-baked stuff that you're bringing out to market that needs funding and the reputation of you know yourself and your work and your, your you know studio, if you want to call it that ends up trading down in the ecosystem and and it can be the self-fulfilling sort of negative prophecy um, and we, we just chose to pass the marshmallow test and be patient and the goal with atomic has always been every subsequent company we build should be better than the last the quality mm. should be higher than the last it should be less risk than the last and we should only increase the quantity of companies we create as we have the infrastructure and we increase the team and our capabilities of being able to deliver higher quality. So by holding ourselves to that constraint, I think that's kind of helped us produce somewhat different results versus a lot of other people I know who have tried this model. You have tons of ideas. The first year they do a dozen. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're spread way too thin and there's way too much going on. And um, you know, you don't have it totally worked out or enough people to kind of make everything work. And, you know, that's that's sort of what we call the trap in this model yeah. that we, we've seen a lot of people fall into. And we see it now that people can trade and, and gamble. It's a FOMO trap. Like you see everything. So everything starts looking good. And then you have this this digestion problem, which the world will be coming to deal with. Um, and so there's some great lessons in there. I want to kind of let that sit. And because you just dropped some some great lessons for people about how to think about both starting companies and investing and setting up companies. You can't do it all. The pizza and the marshmallow stuff is great. Thanks. So in that world, who is, and there's no favorite child, although I have a favorite child, everybody knows, but uh, what is your favorite child of Atomic, like past and present? Like what 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 stands out to you? I can't say. I mean, because, you know, our CEOs listen to this and they'll be upset. So Trust me, they're not listening. I, I honestly can't say. I know say. our numbers. They're not listening. <laughs> I, I, here's what I will say. There are some companies we've built at Atomic. There are several mm -hmm. that will compound and do billions and billions of dollars of revenue because they are just such good companies. And they, I believe, based on what I know now, and that could change and the world could change but they're in such big markets, I think they're gonna grow for a very, very long time. And you know, as I get older, those are more of the kinds of companies I'm interested in. It's just these companies that can just compound for like a really, really, really long time. They're solving a big enough problem. There's enough of an advantage where you know they can just keep going for the long run. And 
Thankfully, we have a bunch of those that we've created that I'm excited about. Um, Two that stand out, I guess, would be Open Store and Homebound to me mm -hmm. in looking through the list. Um, I'll urge people to go see it. Open Store blows my mind because, again, it's the liquidity. You've got the perfect moment of e-commerce and the Thrasio is the world, the Shopify is the Amazon stores, everybody being in business for themselves is that. Open Store is growing really fast, right? Quickly, yeah. that's one that you guys founded there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Open Store isn't even a year old. Um, I started it here in Miami with Keith Ruboys. We kind of started operating it out of my house here for the first two months. And yeah, from being nothing to, I think about within seven, eight, nine months, something like that, we we were able to raise at a $750 million valuation, almost a billion, which is one of the fastest, I think, to that amount of value creation ever. Um, and part of the insight was, you know, there's this boom, as you know, I've been doing things in commerce for a very long time. There, there's this huge boom in the independent segment of commerce. So that's sort of like the off Amazon segment of commerce. Yeah. So Amazon's still growing. It's going to keep compounding. But there's so many tools for entrepreneurs to start companies online today. There's now 30 million people with online storefronts. And, and part of that Shopify. But there's tons of others like them. Shopify is about 2 million entrepreneurs. Yeah, you know, there's like Magento and there's like Adobe stuff. Yeah, there, yeah, there's over a dozen. And, um, you know, they start these companies and it turns out about 80% of them build them to at, at some point they would love an exit. You know, some people will, will build them because they want cash flows forever or it's going to be a family business or whatever. But the vast majority, four out of four, five, they, they want some sort of an exit. And initially, when they build these kinds of companies, they don't tend to be venture backed. So they're usually owned 100 percent by the founder or close to 100 percent by the founder. And they kind of grow on free cash flow organically in the early days on on platforms like Shopify. And, you know, they reach this point and, and, you know, I became aware of this from actually mentoring an entrepreneur who is building a business like this, where they've kind of done a lot of work and, and it, they have this choice. They have this chasm. They, they can either cross a chasm and raise capital and try to get 50, 100, 200 million in sales and then exit to private equity or go public or something like that. Or they've built something that's, you know, in the millions of revenue. They can take a win. They don't have any investors. They own 100% or close to 100% of the company. That could be life-changing money for them for the rest of their life. And then they can go do the next thing, which could be another business like that, or it could be a totally different business. And you know, they have no idea how to go about that. They have no idea how to get offers. And I just had this idea, you know, man, what if we could build a business? What, what if we could build a website? where people like that could come, which is now open.store. Mm -hmm. And all they needed to do was give us their Shopify login information. And we would take their customer huh. table and Stripe transaction yeah. data and bank account and Google and Facebook. And algorithmically, we would compute a price for their, their business with the goal of that being in an hour. Today, it's a 24 hours, so it's not an hour yet. But the goal is to, in an hour, we will give you a price for your company. And you can choose whether or not to sell it instantly and you know we'll close on it very shortly thereafter um and so you know we set out to build this we've built an incredible team here in miami of some of the best data science people we've ever worked with engineers product people it's a really amazing company and there have been points so far this year where you know there have been weeks where we've, we've bought four companies in a week and you know the goal this year is to get to the point of buying a company every day, um, which is a is a pretty big goal. So you can see how quickly this this company can scale, and then there's just massive abilities. Unlike people who are doing this on Amazon, where you know they'll buy a company, maybe SEO the products a little bit, improve them a little bit. You're but you're you're in Amazon sandbox. It's Amazon's customer. It's not your customer. For Shopify, there's just a lot more that can be done, and you know we've operated these businesses before, so we know how to optimize and grow these kinds of companies. There's a lot more that can be done to create value there. Um, and, you know, we're taking kind of like a technology first approach of how to do that systematically across these merchants. And, you know, there, there's a big opportunity even over time as we acquire more and more to create a consumer destination or multiple consumer destinations that could be really exciting. So um, we've been having a blast doing it so far. And, um, 
yeah, extremely. Well, I mean, it's about. just it's it's ocean, it's white ocean. So yeah. so and and Keith did Open Door, which mm-hmm. kind of the same concept, which may not work as well in housing, but that's for another conversation. Um, but the liquidity drives all this. All these things, mm-hmm. we can make fun of all this stuff forever. But what blows my mind is we are way better off if there's more liquidity in the system. And, mm-hmm. and your focus has been on creating liquidity for all these different things. Mm-hmm. And and that's why we're in a better place. It's easy to be bearish, but like liquidity drives progress. So I want to end with two things. We'll end with inflation because that's what you were panicked about, mm-hmm. seriously or not seriously, but we should talk about it quickly. Mm-hmm. But outside of FANG, mm-hmm. you talk about compounding, you talk about big ideas. There Are there two companies, I don't know if you follow public markets or not or care, mm-hmm. are there two companies that aren't in FANG that just have all this compounding opportunity that stand out to you if management continues to execute? Are there any two that stand out? Hmm. That is a good question. I'll throw it to Shopify, Airbnb. Do those ring true to you in any way? Yeah. Shopify, definitely. Airbnb, it, it depends. I mean, Airbnb definitely has network effects. It's it's growing not at the same, exactly the same rate as Shopify. Shopify is just built on worldwide e-commerce growing forever, which as long as you're along that, I think there's tremendous opportunities for that company. So I think that that's, I think that that's a good one. Um, so if not Airbnb, is there anything else that stands out? Yeah. You know, I think that there are a bunch of SaaS names that I think people probably don't know who listen to th- this podcast that mm-hmm. aren't going to be as interesting for people to know about, but SaaS companies can compound for a really long time. Maybe, maybe one name that people will know. Um, I do think Square has an ability to compound for a really long time and people underestimate them a little bit and they've been hit a lot recently. So Yeah, I underestimate them. I feel like they went conglomerate. Mm-hmm. But again, that, we, we don't have to talk about stocks, but that's interesting. So so Square stands out to you even though they kind of are all over the place? They're a little all over the place, but they do have exceptional talent. The Cash app at times has been a top three app in the App Store, which mm-hmm. I think is really interesting. They have embraced crypto in interesting ways, and they have a long roadmap for that. I mean, Jack obviously changed the company name to Block. Um, and you know, I, I think that all sorts of things in payments, that's also just you know riding on the rails of the entire world in some ways is what is what that company is doing mm-hmm. and they're doing it in ways where that growth will continue to compound for a very long time um and they do have a track record of launching new things that have done very well and succeeded very well so i've liked that company i think that would be one to dig into and look at now given what's happened in this most recent cycle yeah i mean it's down from 300 to 100 okay great so last thing, inflation. Mm-hmm. You said you were panicked, but I'm like, how serious are you worried about that? Yeah, I think, you know, this is something I've been bringing up to people who are asking me about this for the past year. Inflation, I don't think we've really seen inflation. Most people who are alive and investing right now and are either doing venture capital or are entrepreneurs starting companies, they just haven't seen inflation to these levels ever before. I don't even know that a lot of policymakers have. So this is kind of completely new territory for us. Um, and I think that the way that it's being thought about, there are some flaws in it. And I, I don't see it being addressed in, in a way that gives me comfort. And, you know, one of one of those ways is just labor, you know, labor participation has gone down a lot in the United States economy. There's been the great resignation. There are some companies we work with that are partners of our companies that, you know, maybe operate factories where they've had to try to increase wages by 50% just to get people to come into work and take shifts and people still won't come into work. So, you know, this whole people got used to staying at home. People don't want to go work in factories. It sort of explains the supply chain shortage, the physical good shortage, physical good prices going up, which is what CPI mentions and, and talks a lot about construction prices going up, home prices going up. Um, and, you know, I think a huge component of that is labor and, you know, labor, there's supply and demand and supply has gone down over time. And I don't see a lot being done to increase supply. Immigration's gone down a lot. 
that's both been, you know, traditional immigration, skilled immigration fell off a cliff. There's like no immigration in the United States anymore. And then, you know, for all the things you would say about illegal immigration, I'm not going to say I'm a proponent of illegal immigration in any way, but, you know, the flow of people that were coming into the United States willing to take some of these lower end jobs has completely ceased. Um, Trump certainly did not succeed in building the wall. However, there was massive deployment of technology on the southern border, which has made it nearly impossible for people to come across that border. Hmm. So you've had in the US, people willing to work go down. You've had legal immigration go to zero. You've had illegal immigration basically go to zero. So you have this like massive, massive depression of the supply of labor in the economy. And I just am worried, you know, I don't hear policymakers talk about this part of it. And, you know, they just think it's this monetary economics game. And, and of course, all of that plays into these things and, and could be somewhat helpful. But, you know, that that's a long term thing that I don't hear about that that worries me a little bit. And I think needs to be some part of the future. You know, you, the, the long term optimist, of course, would say, well, technology can fix that and make people a lot more productive. And, and that's is happening and will continue to to work play out even if people don't want to work but um you know i think that's that's one piece that's miss, missing and then i think the other piece that's missing is the fiscal versus monetary stimulus difference of um you know the way that the fiscal stimulus was implemented at the federal level normally if you did fiscal stimulus the the government would spend money on infrastructure that goes mm -hmm. to companies it actually creates jobs it increases jobs and supply of labor and then that filters into people's paychecks and they spend money in the economy the a massive amount of liquidity that went directly into people's pockets um, causing labor to go down demand to increase at the same time so ability to produce goods goes down and receive goods goes down and demand for goods goes up and now those people don't really want to go back to work um it just you know i don't know if this is the right policy response to it is it that's sort of my my fear with it yeah. and and it you know yes we have seen inflation before at points in, in u.s history but rather than just the blunt instrument approach which it seems like we're we're taking could there be other things should there be other things that we're thinking about and should there be other discussions being had in the in the government? I would certainly hope so, because it, it feels like a, a really big problem that is completely out of my hands and, you know, your hands and can affect everything that all of us do um, with our daily lives. Well, I think, listen, I rarely say this. The great knowledge dropped. I totally agree with you. What we can do is just you know, continue to push, but, but understand that the risks are out there. It's not, uh, you have to take it seriously. This inflation might not just be a blip. And so you've got to be prepared for it. Well, hopefully this has been fun for you. I mean, people are going to love this because you're just 37 and 35. You know, some people 35, yeah. sorry. Uh, now I'm just going to start saying I'm friends with a 45 year old guy in Miami. The, uh, <laughs> I add age to people. All now. Good. All <laughs> Used good. to be, I subtract it. So um, I really appreciate your time. I think uh, it's of course. quite motivating to people in their 20s and 30s to see what can be accomplished on the internet and using a network so fast and being willing to be mobile. Listen, I think the key thing is young people should just, the one thing they have to realize is they should be mobile. Yeah. And that's a freedom that people weren't taking seriously for too long. Yeah. And it's nice to see people willing to get on a plane and just move, like just start afresh. It's a great country. It's a big country and there's lots of places to start businesses. Uh, I can't wait to have you back. Hopefully I'll leave you, I'll give you some time to, to get back to work. Thanks so much, Jack, for, for coming on the podcast. Yeah, of course. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, I'm excited. Next time I come out, I'll get to uh, chess. We'll go grab a beer. Yeah, that sounds great. Would love to do that. And, you know, on that ending note, I'm just such a fan of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship would encourage anyone young listening to this. Definitely go and build. There's a lot to build. There's a lot of problems, a lot of things to fix. And if you want to do it with us, our doors open. We love starting companies with people and Miami is a great place to do it. We'll be starting a lot of companies here. You're more than welcome to um, apply. We actually have an application process to start 
companies with us. So where where at atomic.com or uh, atomic.vc. Yeah, if you go to atomic.vc, I believe future founders is is one way to apply. I, I think there's other application links on the website. You can send out emails to anyone that and there there are roles listed on the site, but we would love to create more entrepreneurship and and more entrepreneurs in the world. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll promote it in the show notes. Have a great day. Thanks again, Jack, for doing this. And we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Canute. Yeah. Hey. Well, you've you've seen some smart people. I've listened to some smart people. Where does this rank? (laughs) <laughs> it's so hard to rank. There's him. like Kyle it's like, what's your, on what's the your young fa- end. What's There's... your favorite child? I mean, you know, it's impossible. He's brilliant, like vast majority of everyone else is on here. Yeah, you know, Kyle stands out. He stands out. Obviously, Zach. Um, I'm just top of my head, and then uh, Frank Rotman, older but QED. There's just and, and Michelle at Cloudflare. Anyways, um, you were listening to Panic with Friends. That was a treat. To see someone achieving that much. Uh, and that hungry and also doing a lot of charity work which we didn't get to but anyways we'll have him back this is panic with friends i sit with founders entrepreneurs traders investors venture capitalists try and get a little bit ahead of the curve inspire some people to go out and uh, build and grow and take some risk um you can go to spotify or google or apple search my name howard Lindzen. subscribe you'll get a podcast every week tell your friends And uh, I appreciate it for everybody tuning in. We will see you next week. Thanks, Knut. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. This inflation 